It's so good to be with you folks. I am excited to get to bring this message to you. Um, I get to bring it to you because I didn't finish it last week. <laughs> and it gave me the opportunity to focus in on something that I saw in the text that um, it fits within this whole section of Scripture. We've been talking about the king and his credentials and how the, the writer Matthew wanted you and I to know that Jesus Christ is more than just the heir to the throne of David. He is the Son of God, the Messiah, Savior, and He's come for us. Amen? He wants us to know that. But you have to admit that the people whose lives he interrupted must have been a little bit thrown. I want you to imagine just for a moment and try to connect with Joseph. How many of you have been impressed with Joseph so far? And it's interesting, Matthew wrote through the lens of this guy. Uh, Joseph's lineage is in the genealogy of chapter 1 and it's it's, it's the pregnancy of Mary through the eyes of Joseph and his response and his obedience. And the more I watch this guy, the more impressed I am with him. But I feel like he becomes an incredible person for us to discuss a very important issue in the Christian life. And the issue is one of protection. How many of you have been protected by God? Amen. Say amen to that. And yet, how many of you would have to admit that your life has not gone the way you planned? And I find that that is an incredible tension point. Because many people come to faith in Jesus Christ thinking, now it's all good, and life will get more stable. So I just want you to imagine this morning being Joseph. I mean, your life according to this, is not what you expected. You've gone from plan A, which is you've apprenticed in your dad's carpentry shop. You're going to take over the business someday. You're going to marry, marry, you know. You're going you're gonna to probably have a few kids, and, and, if you're, and if you're really good, you might even expand the shop, maybe put on a new wing, you know, I don't know. You're going you're gonna to live up in the land of Galilee and Nazareth, and, 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 and you're going to basically keep worshiping God, and it's going to be good, right? And that was your plan. And then you discover God's plan. And God's plan was a little different. You see, you didn't know, but you're going to be the adoptive father of the Messiah. You're not going to stay in Nazareth. You're going to get called out to go to the city of your origin, of your father's Bethlehem. You're going to be called there at a time when your wife is going to give birth to a child that is not yours. You're not going to stand outside with the other men while all the relative ladies take care of that. No, you're going to be a midwife. And in a stable, surrounded by all the joys of a stable, you're going to be with her and nervous as a cat as you literally catch the Son of God. That night after the trauma wears off and you've got them both in blankets, and suddenly shepherds start pouring into the stable, trying to get up and touch your newborn baby, you realize my life is weird. <laughs> oh, and you don't get to go back to Nazareth. You spend everything you had just to get down to this little town of Bethlehem. And after the weeks go by and you've been cobbling together odd jobs, you've been able to put up enough resources that you get to buy a home, a little 10 by 10 palatial palace in the middle of Bethlehem. And you begin to think, wow, God, I guess He's your Son and this is the city of David. Maybe I'm not bound for Nazareth. Maybe I have to start a new life here. And you start working on that. Months go by and you're beginning to get a sense of you're making connections in Bethlehem. It's all coming together and you think this is where it's going to be. And then one night on your way home, you can't even get in the doorway for all the camels and the Persian soldiers surrounding your house. And when you finally break through, fearful of what you're going to find, the who's who 
who of Persian royalty are bowing on the ground and kissing the feet of your toddler son. And there's a chest of gold and frankincense and myrrh and more money than you've ever seen in a lifetime. And that night when they all clear out and you've got your arm around your wife and you're looking across the room because you only have one room, at a chest, you think, wow, God, maybe your, plan, maybe your plan, God, is that I'm supposed to stay in Bethlehem, and you have just like lightning jumped my progress forward. I have enough money here. I can buy the business I'm working for. Maybe the whole thing is, God, that the Messiah is going to be grow up in the, in the city of David, and this is where he's going to launch his campaign, and my job is to give stability to Mary and the child, and I can see it, and the business is unfolding, but then you fall asleep. Very dangerous to be Joseph and falling asleep. <laughs> Get up. Immediately. Take what you have and run. And flee. Where? Egypt. E Egypt. How long? When I tell you. And so can you imagine finding yourself yet again, maybe you got a donkey, I don't know, on a hundred mile trek to Egypt with no idea of how long you're going to stay. Friends, this is the point I want to make, and this is why I want to dive into this passage. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you came to a king. He is a sovereign God. And He has a will and a plan and a purpose and a story that is unfolding. He has things He is going to accomplish. And now you are no longer in your story by the grace of God because your story was headed to a Christless eternity apart from God. But now you are part of the story. But it's not about you. And it's not about your plans. And it's not about your purposes. And God, if you go to Scripture, this is the one thing you will discover. He loves you and He will protect you. You are kept by the power of God. Say amen, church. Amen. But He will keep you in His plan and His purposes. I think a lot of us live here, and I just want you to see how this unfolds today. So open your Bible up, Matthew chapter 2, and I want to show you something very encouraging. How many of you are glad that God warns us? How many of you are glad for the instruction of God in your life? The provision, the protection? I'm glad that He warns us, and I want you to see how powerful His warning is. Verse 12 is referencing the Magi. It says this, you know, and you've got to imagine this. This is right after they've come, they've given their gifts to Jesus, an amazing moment of worship. They all go out, uh, and, and they get back in their tents, they go to sleep, and they wake up in the morning. But it says this, And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. See, riding behind this story, there is a building suspense. You remember Herod? He's done an incredible Oscar-worthy job of, t of making the Magi feel like he's great with this. Hey, go, and, and when you find the child, come back, report to me that we can all worship him together. Uh, is that what Herod wants to do? No, he wants to kill him. And the Magi don't know it. And you're wondering, how's this going to work out? I mean, he's under threat of life. And then God just deflates all the suspense by doing what? He warns them all in a dream. How are you glad that God is not reliant upon our warning systems? How are you glad in your life He is not barred by what you don't know and what you can't see? He literally comes, and I just got to imagine, you know, these Persian rulers get up in the morning and one guy, you know, they're having their coffee. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, but literally they look at, you know, and I believe we need to leave 
we need to leave immediately and we need to not go back to Herod. I had the same. Did you have the? I had a dream. What was it? Look, we don't know. We're just told they're warned by God. You know, but you need to know. Remember we ended last week? These guys were there to worship the king. They had been led by God with a star, you know, the vision of God's glory, all of that. So they are already tuned and wired to be following God. When he gets up and he tells them, don't go that way, they literally leave by a different route. I love it. They have been tuned to God's revelation, so they respond to it. Uh, what I saw on this is that I think God has the ability to intervene and rescue regardless of the challenges we face. Anybody say amen to that? Anybody got challenges? How many of us look at them and the only solutions we can think of are human? What I love in this is how many of you are glad that we serve a supernatural God? And if he wants to redirect traffic so you get somewhere on our time, he can do that. He can do whatever he wants, and he literally intervenes. Some of us take these stories and we simplify them. Literally, how do you get a cohort of 200 Persian soldiers and countless magi out of a tiny place in Bethlehem? Literally, their campsite was as big as the city. How do you do that? They get up in the morning. They gather everybody in, we're leaving, and we're taking a different route. Can you imagine being a soldier? Suddenly you head out, and you're heading directly east of Bethlehem. Can I tell you what's directly east of Bethlehem, gang? Nothing. How many of you know the story? It's going to be in Matthew as well. Jesus taking out into the wilderness. That's what it's talking about. Do you know what's in the wilderness? Nothing. When the Bible wants to talk to you about a place that's devoid of a lot of life and arid, it uses the word desert. When it wants to tell you taking you out into a place that there's nothing, it uses the word wilderness. So can you imagine that morning, you're a soldier marching out of Bethlehem into the wilderness going, why are we going this way and why are we whispering? Because they'd all been told to be silent. Put blankets on your camel's feet so you don't stir up dust. I just like the detail God goes to to make sure that His plan unfolds. Anybody else? Because some of us don't see God overcoming the obstacles. God is not hindered in directing our lives. Say amen, church. He is not unhindered. He warns. And I know this is a unique place, but what is powerful here to me is the way that God warns. It's unhindered. It's also authoritative. Look at the beginning of verse 13. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. <laughs> if you're underlining things in your Bible, anytime you see a behold, underline it. Because it's like God saying, Hey, pay attention. I want to show you something. Behold, look. What does he want him to look at? This authoritative warning. How many of you know that this warning is a command? This is imperative. <laughs> Joseph's in the middle of his sleep. Get up! Now. Get up immediately and flee. The word there is you must depart immediately and run. And you must flee to Egypt. How many of you know Egypt's 100 miles away? Couldn't we go with I build a shop plan? No, go immediately. This is what I think is powerful, friends. How many of you know that we are the recipients of God's instruction supernaturally all the time? What is sitting in your lap is better than any angelic appearance you will ever have. This is the Word of God. It is divine and supernatural. And its instruction knows you and the course of your life. And some of you think somehow it would be more spiritual if oh, an angel showed up and said, get up! When God says 500 times to you every day, do this, go there, obey here. And it is supernatural. And it is divine. But do you understand this? It is costly. Did you see what he said? Go and remain until I tell you. 
Literally leave everything you're thinking about, do what I say, and do it until I tell you differently. There's a reason why a lot of us struggle to do our devotions. Because this is the way our God speaks to us. This is His divine protection. His warning to us is authoritative. Go! Go! And I love this because some of us wonder why God would do this. How many of you would say this might be a little inconvenient? How about a little scary? Why couldn't have God dealt with this differently? How many of you know He could have took Herod out if He wanted to? How many of you know that the, the soldiers sent to destroy the child? Couldn't have God blinded them if He wanted to? I mean, he's not limited in any way. We just said that. I also think it's pretty profound that though God supernaturally warns Joseph, is there any word that he supernaturally did anything on the journey? I mean, you were met by an angel. Now hike a hundred miles. How many of you would rather have the Ethiopian eunuch story where Philip just sort of, whoop, you know, and there he is? But that's not what happened. God sends them, and you say, why, God, do you protect in this way? Because God has purposes and plans in everything He does for us, friends. And the reason we move when God tells us to move and we obey when God tells us to obey is because of who our God is. How many of you know that your God is omniscient? He knows everything. He knows exactly what's going to unfold. He planned it. Look at the informed warning of God at the end of verse 13. It says, For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. How many of you know that God is not surprised by Herod's plans at all? Herod doesn't even know he's going to do this yet. Herod hasn't got any clue. He hasn't figured out that the, the Magi have left. God tells you, this is exactly what's going to happen. And for that matter, how many of you know that he knows exactly what's going to happen in your life? He knows your day before you've had it. He knows your car better than you. He knows your child better than you. He knows what illnesses are coming down the pike. He knows what challenges are on their way. He knows exactly the kind of challenges you're going to run into in the day. And so when he comes to you and says, thus says the Lord, do this, are we being obedient? When he tells us to move, move. Uh, Lamentation 3.37 says, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? We serve an omniscient, sovereign God. He knows exactly what's going to happen. Therefore, move. Obey. Why? Because God is also working in His warning. Listen to this. Look at uh, verses 14 through 15. The God who works. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. Listen to this. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Two things that you've got to understand, church, and I need to understand it too. God works in our obedience. If you want to know about the protective power of God, then the primary way you experience it is obeying His Word. God wants us to obey Him. What I love about Joseph is that he just does it. It says, and he got up. Jesus says, get up. God says, he got up. Boy, there would be the greatest epitaph of my life. When God said, move, he moved. When God said, get up, he got up. That's what he wants of us. I can't stress this enough, friends. The protection of God, listen to me, the protection of God comes through obedience. When we take what He says and we obey it, this is the path forward in our life. What is hard is that God does not give us the end game immediately when He calls us to obey, does He? Ask your wife's forgiveness, men. 
and stay there until I tell you to move. We chuckle, but oh, that's costly. I mean, after all, guys, you don't know how much damage you've done. You don't know how far down this road of repentance God might want to take you. Be honest in this situation. Are you serious? Yeah. Obey me. But what will happen? Obey me. The just shall live by faith. Obey me. Obey me. God does this every day. Everything you're watching in this dramatic moment of Christ is lived out every day in the lives of His kids. If you want to see God work, then you have to be in a posture of obedience because that is where the protection and the purpose and the promotion and the movement of your life as a believer is supposed to take place. Get up. Apologize to your spouse. Be honest with your children. Give to the church. Stay in that relationship. And do it until I tell you otherwise. 1 Samuel 15.22 Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Friends, God is working in our obedience, but do you know what He's working out? He's working out His will and His plan. What is amazing, when you read the rest of it, it says, this was to fulfill what He had spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt, I will, you know, bring my son. I called my son. The priority, listen to this church, and I think this is profound, of the story is Jesus. Did you see that? The priority of what's going on in this moment is Jesus. Uh, all throughout the story, have you noticed how often God says, take the child and his mother? What is he saying? Joseph, take the child, the not your child, the my child, and basically reorient everything about your life for the sake of my son. Do you know that that's exactly what happened when you became a believer in Jesus Christ? Because now, the priority of your life is no longer you. It's Jesus. It's what he's doing. It's what he's fulfilling. This is a story about Christ. You are attached to His story. And contrary to the popular theme of America, you're not the story. Everybody say amen through gritted teeth. You and I, we are now children of the King, but we're not the story. It's Him. And the priority of this story is God's glory. Literally, the whole thing, the dream, the rise up, the flee, all that Herod's doing. Why? Because God in His Word said, out of Egypt, I have called my son. He's quoting Hosea 11.1. 1. If you were to read it, it would talk to you about Israel and would talk about how God called and saved His people Israel out of Egypt. But what this is teaching us, and the New Testament does this, is it shows us what we call a type. A type. What is a type? It's a non-verbal prediction of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that Joseph was a type? That Daniel was a type? That Moses was a type. How do I know they're types? Just because they look like Jesus? No, because the New Testament tells me that's what they were. Don't go back in the Old Testament and say, oh, I love this story. It's kind of like this, and I'll just create something. No, the New Testament is the commentary of God on the Old Testament. you got to know that. And, and literally what he's saying in Hosea is that the actual end game of this prophecy was God was going to say, just like I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I will bring my son out of Egypt. And all of it prefigured what I was going to do in Jesus Christ. Do you guys know that there are 322 
direct prophecies of Messiah, and God is not willing to leave any box unchecked because they all contribute to the glory of the God who spoke things into existence before time was, and His end game is the glorification of His Son because as He exalts Jesus Christ, we are all saved in Christ and we will all be to the praise of the glory of His grace. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> so what box is God checking about His Son in your issue today? Because it's a long way to Egypt. The illness, what's the point? Why? Why my kid? Why that, God? Why this hard? Why this long? Why this loss? Why this journey? Why this unexpected? Because you are now part of the story of the glorification of God in His Son, Jesus Christ. And you are now part of the glory that God is getting. So the next time somebody asks you how your week is, you can tell them, well... <laughs> Still in Egypt, but God's checking a box, amen? God's doing a work. You may be sitting here today asking, why am I in this spot as a believer? I love God. I'm trying to do my best. Why this spot? Because God has attached you to His story of glory. And I will tell you this, church, by faith, because some days it's hard to feel it, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Well, if you can see all that, God's warning, you know, unfolding here, then you can also see that another part of our life is that in the midst of all that God is doing, how many of you are aware that we have some opposition? We have an enemy a spiritual enemy. And in this case, we have a very physical enemy, and his name is Herod. And you can see how he responds to God's intervention in verse 16. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all of its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Every once in a while you'll be reading in Scripture and you will suddenly realize that it's not a human book because they don't put stories like this in books of fiction. They don't tell the story of how innocent lives were slaughtered. And there's always perspective that you can think of. Some of us think of how horrific this moment would be probably in a city the size of Bethlehem and the surrounding area, you might be talking about 20, maybe 20 babies. Matthew is the only one who records this moment. And it is horrific. And it's awful. Uh, many people think it doesn't get recorded in other places because Herod was just this terrible. And in these ending years of his life, a lot of horrible things happen. Um, but this horrific act of evil that is committed by Herod out of anger, it's hard for us to respond. How many of you know when you read Scripture, it's hard when you bump into place and you go, how can this be part of God's unfolding story? Until I ask you the question, has anything hard or horrible happened to you? Has God failed? Is He done? Has He bottled up every tear? Will He hold all things accountable? Is he working all things? Yes, all of that's true, but you still find these moments that are horrible. I will take you to another place in Scripture. We won't go there, but if you went all the way back into the book of Exodus, you would see this is not the first time that Satan tried to destroy the promises of God and the redemptive plan of God. Can I just tell you something about your enemy? Many of us think of Satan and you think like he's, he, he, he hates the good people and he loves the bad people. You know, the high fivers, Satan, you and I, we're doing evil together. Woo! Take the worst person you've ever known and understand that Satan hates them with a hatred that cannot be quenched. He hates them. 
The most evil thing that you can think of in a person, Satan hates them more. You know why? Because they were created in the image of God. They were created to reflect God's glory. This is God, Satan's plan for us. He wants us dead. He wants us destroyed. He wants us far from God as we can be. He, he has one plan. It is the destruction of God's creation and the destruction of those who would worship Him. He has always sought, and every once in a while, Scripture peels back the veil, and you see our enemy for how awful he is. But certainly, it was Satan working in the heart of Herod that said, this is a good plan, just go kill everybody and slaughter them. But if you go back into Exodus, how many of you know that Satan's probably read this book a little more than you? How many of you know that he was probably aware of the promises of God? Jacob, Abraham, that your people will leave this land and sojourn in another one for 400 years, and who right around the time 400 years was coming along, who might have had the little thought to put it in the mind of Pharaoh that it would be a good idea to cull the Israelite people and to kill all of the newborns of Israel, ensuring what? That any person who might arise who could be a deliverer and lead God's people out of, I of Egypt would be destroyed? And what you see going on in Bethlehem is out of the playbook of our spiritual enemy who hates Jesus Christ with all the passion that he has and wants his glory to be destroyed. You see the fury, and it's awful. It's awful. But even in this, though it is awful, I want you to see the control and the moving of God because you see the fury, but look at the fulfillment. It says, Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. This is another type in Scripture. If you go to Jeremiah 31.15, this is where you read this prophecy, and what you find out is that you're like, how does Ramah and Bethlehem have anything to do with each other? Ramah's north of the city, five miles. It's not over by Bethlehem. And people go, how are these put together? Well, it's talking about Rachel responding when her people Israel were taken away into captivity and removed from the land of promise, and they were taken away, and she figuratively wept. She's not been alive for some time, but it's literally ownership, figuratively wept. And what the Bible is saying is just as Rachel wept over the loss and the death of the life of her people because they were far from God, here is another moment of brokenness in Scripture where people are far from God and innocents die, and all of this happens because there is a failure to acknowledge the true king. What Matthew doesn't include is what happens in the rest of Jeremiah 31. How many of you have ever heard of the New Covenant? Jeremiah 31 ends not with weeping, but it ends with the promise of God that one was going to come. And because He comes, a new covenant would be made with the people of God, and that covenant would be based upon the fact that no longer would they be under this, this law that they could never fulfill, but God would write His law in their hearts, and He would forgive their sins, and all the distance between them and God would be removed. How many of you glad for the salvation of Jesus Christ? Anybody? How many of you glad that there is something that overcomes all of the broken and horrible of this world? And its answer is Christ. And so yet again, we have this enemy who rages, but even in his fury, all he can do, though we don't belittle it at all, is check the boxes of a sovereign God who is working in and through all things to glorify himself. Some of you are like, Hill, we're going to do another week. He's not going to end. I am ending. So I want you to see a couple lessons here that I think are important for us to learn. Look at verse 19 through 23. It says this, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up. There he is again. Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up. And took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, I'm not going to even pronounce that right. Anyway, Herod's kid. 
was reigning over Judah in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in the city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. (laughs) So, what do you learn? If your life comes into contact with Jesus then you have been drawn into the story of the ages. If you are a believer today, you have been put in contact with Jesus Christ. You are now part of the unfolding story of Jesus Christ in this world. What a privilege. Amen, church? It will rewrite your story and take you beyond your version of life. Whatever you think is the best, It's not. You may hunger for a stability because you've gone through broken things in your life. You may long for a certain kind of relationship and that's sort of your end game. And God says, that will never satisfy your soul. You don't know it yet. You've got things you want God to fix. You've got things that you just think, that's the greatest thing that could happen. And He says, my child, I have written you into the story of time and eternity. I have given you new life through the ultimate person, Jesus Christ the righteous. I have allowed you to partake of His life through His sacrifice. Therefore, you will never miss this story because you will be around forever. And as you are there, the unfolding glory of God will be your privilege to worship forever. So, Obedience, God's warning, to supernatural authority are the norm. Did you hear it? Here's your first lesson. Obedience to supernatural authority is the norm. Friend, every time you open this book, part of the question of the believer is, Lord, what are you telling me to do today? How are you instructing my life? Um, How many of you know that this book knows you? And it's written for you in this moment. And just as supernatural as God appearing in a dream is you opening this book and the Holy Spirit of God taking the words of God and speaking directly to you. Are you kidding? I'm in Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus! I don't know how, but Leviticus, you know? And as you obey, As you obey, you enter in to the purposes and the plans of God to be glorified. What you have to understand and not be offended by, but it will be the greatest moment of maturity for you, is to get over the fact that you're not the center of the story. I'm telling you, friends, so many of us want to be valued and we almost take God's care for us and make it like a a checkbook. Do you really love me, God? Because when you show me you really love me, then I'll follow you. And God comes back and says, I died for you. I rose for you. I have transformed you. Get up. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. I love you to the uttermost. And your joy is now attached to my glory. You're not unimportant, church. You are not unimportant. But you are not primary. And if you live your life like you are, you bury yourself. Because part of the story might be your day in the ditch. And you may be in the ditch longer than you want to be in the ditch, but you are there because God is moving and working. And you need to be able to sit in that rut and say to the praise of the glory of God's grace, here I am today. And that will give you confidence. Ultimately, we need to believe in the sovereignty of our God. It seems like every random chaotic thing, you know, get up, go to Egypt. Why? Because out of Egypt I called my son. Get up, go back to Galilee. Well, I'm not sure where to go. More instruction. And you settle in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Apparently, Because the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. 
And if you guys will begin to obey and trust in the sovereignty of God, our good God will begin to show you the glory of His story. I got any saints in here a little older than me? You testify to, the un, to God's movement in the winding road of your life? Any of you? Young person? You want a great afternoon? Invite somebody in here with gray hair out to lunch and say, tell me the story of Jesus in your life. Don't tell me the glossy one. Tell me about Egypt. Tell me that one. Because I need to know that there's a God who accomplishes His purposes. <laughs> Amen, church? The power of the church is when it believes that its king is the king. And it believes that God can reach us wherever He wants us and protect us. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, what we see unveiled in the story of our Savior's birth, we get to experience in the course of our lives. God, I've got people in here who've been, uh, they've been warned in a dream. They've been warned in Your Word. God, You're calling them to an obedience and it just doesn't seem reasonable. Oh God, would You give them courage to obey and, and believe in this moment that You are writing the story of Jesus in them. May we all today realize, God, that obedience takes us into the place where You're in control. You're leading the ship, God. We want to follow You, but we're nervous. So God, take the Word today and remind us that You are moving and You're accomplishing Your purposes. And You're doing them in the undones and the, the pauses and the start-stops of our life. But God, we praise You. We praise You for salvation. We praise You for making us part of the story of Jesus Christ. God, we have no business being part of this story but for the grace of God. So Lord, today, be with your people. May we live obedient to the story of our Savior in this world that others may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.